Hello, my name is Shahriyar Shahriyari, and this is a lecture in a series of lectures on introductory combinatorics based on my book, An Invitation to Combinatorics. The subject of this lecture is recurrence relations and finding them for solving counting problems. Um, the, the way to watch these videos is always to stop the videos um, whenever I ask a question or um, all the time throughout the video and try to doing the whatever it is that we're doing yourself and then uh, letting the video go and, and seeing what, what happens. Uh, so let's get started. In counting problems, a lot of times or sometimes, instead of trying to find a formula for whatever it is that we are gonna count instead of actually counting, we find a recurrence relation. And what a recurrence relation is, find, is, is to find a function in terms of its prior occurrences. Instead of finding a formula for f of n, f of n might be the number of ways of doing something, um, we find f of n in terms, we find a formula for f of n in terms of f of n minus one, f of n minus two, and so forth. Um, and, and this doesn't give us a formula for f of n, but what it does do is allows us to calculate as many terms in, um, of that sequence as, as we would like using the recurrence relation. In fact, using the recurrence relation, we can get a lot of information about our counting problem. Our focus in this lecture is how to construct or come up with the recurrence relations, not so much what to do afterwards with them, but how to come up with them. Um, if you do come up with them, then you can generate data using them, and, and you can might be able to see patterns from the data, and you can prove those using induction. And in fact, recurrence relations are particularly suited for induction proofs. Induction doesn't help you to come up with uh, conjectures and ideas about patterns, but it helps you prove them. And if you have a recurrence relation, that will be uh, very, very helpful and useful to do. There's other things you can do with recurrence relations other than uh, this pattern, but this is one that uh, we will use often. Um, and we will talk about other things uh, later on as well. What we will do in this lecture is we will go through four detailed examples. So let's get started. The first problem is a problem about dominoes. So I have a one by two dominoes. Um, so, so these are the, the, the pieces I have, and I have many of them. And I want to know in how many ways can I cover two by eight array using these one by two dominoes. So here's my array. This is two rows and eight columns. And I want to place these dominoes on these squares in a way to cover them. So for example, I might, for example, um, cover them in this way. This would be one way of covering uh, the two by eight array. The two by eight array has 16 uh, um, squares and therefore I do need eight dominoes. Eight is not the answer I'm looking for. I'm looking for how many different ways uh, can I place the dominoes on this array. So for example, this would be one way, but another way would be to put different ones of them horizontally and different ones of them vertically. So this would be a second way of um, doing, um, of covering the uh, two by eight array using one by two dominoes. And the question is that, what are all the different ways that you can do that? Think of the two by eight array as sitting fixed on the table, and then you're trying to uh, place these dominoes. What are all the, how many different ways could you do that? Okay, now, the, the way we do the, I mean, this is just a specific problem and it's a specific number is the answer, but, but I'm not gonna try to find that. Instead, I'm gonna try to do something that might seem uh, a little bit counterintuitive at, the, at first, which is to make the problem harder. I'm going to generalize the problem so that to put this problem in the context of a sequence of problems, and then I can uh, try to find a recurrence relations for them. So the first thing I do is I generalize the problem. Instead of saying I have a two by eight array, I will say that, the number of ways of covering a two by n array. I, I extend the array uh, to have n columns, and but I still will use one by two dominoes. So I have the same kind of dominoes, but I have a much longer, I mean, maybe shorter, maybe longer array um, two by n. And the answer is going to be hn. And the thing that I'm looking for finally is h8. If it's two by eight array, how many ways can I do that? The next thing I do is I perform a thought experiment. I, I try to think through what my first step is in, um, in tiling uh, the two by n array. So what are my choices for to get started? And, and, and this is something, a common thing we do when we are trying to find recurrence relations for, for, for a uh, counting problem. So here we are trying to find hn. hn is a function of n, depending on what n is, hn is going to be different. Instead of finding a formula for hn, 
I want to find HN in terms of the prior occurrences. And the way to do that is to think, to do this little thought experiment that I'm about to do, thinking about how would I start the tiling? So how do I start the tiling? Well, here's my array. How do I start? I start on the, on the, on the left, for example, and I have two choices. Either I'm going to put a horizontal tile or a vertical tile. If I put a horizontal tile, I'll have to put another horizontal tile, tile on top. And that would be one way to start, to put two horizontal, um, two, um, um, one by two dominoes, and, and then do whatever afterwards. That's one, one, one way to start. Another way to start is to start uh, putting the first one vertically. After I do that, then I, I, I'm not, nothing is forced after that, and I can do whatever I want afterwards. Okay. Now, if I start with two horizontal tiles, so there's two choices, two paths when I, before I start tiling, and that's my thought experiment. I've got two paths. Either I do two horizontal tiles or I do one vertical tile. If I do two horizontal tiles, then what's the task at hand? What the task remains? Well, I've got to tile the rest. But what is the rest? The rest is a two by n minus two array. Um, it's similar to what I started out with. It's just that it's a little bit shorter. And how many ways can I do that? Well, if I knew that, I probably would know the answer to the original question. The point is that I've named the problem. I've said that if you have two by blah array, then the number of ways of um, um, tiling it by these uh, one by two dominoes is H blah. And now that I have a two by N minus two array left, the number of ways to, um, uh, to, to tile it is H sub N minus two, because that's what the length of the array is. Now, but that wasn't the only thing I could do. I could also start with one vertical tile. If I do that, what is left? Well, again, an array is left. This time it's a two by N minus one array left. And how many ways can I complete that? Again, I don't know the answer, but I do know the answer in terms of the, um, the, the function that I've defined HN. Um, I can finish that in HN minus, way, HN minus one ways. So because the array is two by N minus one. I, if it's a two by n array, the number of ways that I can uh, tile it is, is hn. If it's um, uh, n, two by n minus one array, the number of ways that I can tile it is hn minus one. If it's two by n minus two array, the number of ways that I can um, uh, tile it is hn minus two. Now, as I said, if I'm, if I'm tiling this two by n array, there's only two things I can do to start. I can either put a vertical one or two horizontal one. And I know that in either one of those cases, how many ways can I finish the task? And therefore, the total number of ways of um, um, doing, uh, of, of tiling this, this array is the sum of those. And therefore, Hn must be Hn minus two plus Hn minus one. That was the thought, thought experiment that gave me the recurrence relation. Note that I don't use induction to prove, in, to come up with the recurrence relations. I do this thought experiment trying to um, um, open up the problem and put it, make, put it into different cases maybe um, to see um, how I can uh, bring it back together. Okay. Also, uh, whenever you have a recurrence relation, you need to have some um, initial cases because the recurrence relation tells you how to find HN in terms of prior cases. But unless you have some few things to begin with, and in this case, in this way, it, it is sort of like induction, um, you can't get started. So H1 is one. If you, have a, um, if you have a two by one array, then the only way thing you can do is to put one horizontal domino. And if you have, and so the H1 is one. And if you have a two by two array, then you can put two horizontal ones or two vertical ones. You've got two ways of, of tiling that. So H2 is two. Given that, then you can find um, um, as many things as you want. So the number of ways of covering a two by an array with one by two dominoes, what we found is that Hn is Hn minus two plus Hn minus one. That's the recurrence relation that we found for the counting problem that we were solving. And we also had the initial conditions that H1 is one and H2 is two. These are what commonly is known as the Fibonacci numbers named after um, uh, Fibonacci, which was a 13th, who was a 13th century mathematician who, um, uh, who, who, who worked on this. So it gave a problem uh, that 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 came that um, uh, that uh, featured these numbers, but these numbers have been studied uh, many centuries earlier. Um, uh, in fact, second third B century BCE by uh, Indian commentators, um, and and one of them, Pingala, is is one that I also um, attach uh, his name to these numbers as well. And 
so so these are very easy to do. So we have we start with one and two. That was h one was one, h two was two, and then everyone after that is just the sum of the ones before. So uh, the third one is one plus two. The fourth one is one two plus three. Um, and then five plus eight, eight plus 13, and 13 plus 21, 34. 34 is the answer we were looking for. Um, the number of ways of, uh, of, of tiling that two by eight squared is 34. Um, okay, so that was our first example. Our second example is also a counting problem. So I want to know how many sequences of, of five terms, A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, I can have, well, with these conditions. First of all, each one of these AIs is zero, four, or seven. So I'm only using zeros, fours, and seven to make a sequence of length five. And I have a weird rule that if you have four and seven both in your sequence, then the four should come, the first four should come before the first seven. So I wanna know how many ways I can make sequences like that. So for example, um, Four, 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 seven, seven is one sequence. That, that's five numbers. There are three fours and two sevens, and 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 both four and seven are, are, are do occur. And four comes before seven. Now, no one said that I have to use zero, four, and seven. All three of them. I'm just saying, only use zero, four, and seven. But you don't have to use all of them, um, and you don't have to use four and seven at all. So, for example, zero, 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 zero is 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 an example. Uh, but if you do use four and seven, then four needs to come before seven. Um, on the other hand, for example, seven, 74,000 and 00747 are non-examples. Those are not the kinds of sequence of five uh, integers that I would, would want to count because in those uh, four and seven do come, but, but the first four is not before the first seven. Okay, so it's a very odd kind of a problem and, and I would like to count that. And again, the purpose of this lecture is not so much solving counting problems, but, but setting up recurrence relations that will be helpful in solving counting problems. So, um, so again, we generalize first and we say that let h of n be in the number of sequences um, of length n, not necessarily length five, but length n, like n of them, with the same conditions, such that each one of those terms is zero, four, and seven. And if both four and seven occur in the sequence, the first four occurs before the first seven. So that's the, our condition. And, and what we're looking for really is h of five, but we generalize the problem so that we can, uh, we can see how uh, we, whether or not we can come up with a recurrence relation. So um, what is h1? Um, h of one would mean that it's, it's just one number and um, made a, it's either zero, four or seven. And you could put any one of those three things because uh, you're never gonna have both four and seven. So you never have to worry about four coming before seven or not. And so those are the only possibilities. So H of one is three. What about H of two? Um, so that's pairs of numbers. And so you can have zero, 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 four, zero, four, seven, four, zero, four, four, 47, 70, Z, seven, zero, seven, seven. One thing you cannot have is 74. So these are the possibilities. So, so uh, the, there's three choices for the first entry, three choices for the first, second one, that's three times three, nine, but 74 is not allowed. So that's eight of them, or you can just count them. So H of two is eight. So that's H of one and H of two. Um, already there's it's not so straightforward to count these. So I really do not want to go up to H of five. And that's why I want to find a recurrence relation instead. So Again, how do we do it? Um, uh, recurrence relation. Um, we again do a thought experiment. So again, we think about how do we start such a sequence. Sometimes you have to worry about how you end this, uh, your counting problem, and sometimes you have to split into cases some other way. But but uh, thinking about how you might start the sequence is a good way to go about it. Well, the sequence you can start it with your own. You don't have that many choices. Either zero, four, or seven. Um, if, you, um, if you start with a zero, so if the first entry is zero, then what after that? Well, after that, you have a sequence of n minus one uh, integers, again, made up of zero, four, and seven, and again, with the same exact restrictions as before, that if both four and seven occur, four needs to, the first four needs to come before seven. It's no different than the original one. Putting that zero at the beginning didn't change the game at all because you didn't use four or seven. And therefore, um, how many ways can I complete that? The answer is 
h of n minus one. So h of n was how many ways I could make a sequence of length n. Um, so h of n minus one is how many ways I can make a sequence of length n minus one with the same number of, um, let's say, same conditions as before. So that's if I start with a zero. But what if I start with a four? If I start with a four, then I've put that four there right at the beginning. So I've solved all my problems. I don't have to worry about the four coming before the seven because the four is right at the beginning. Therefore, it will come before seven. So after that, I actually have no uh, restrictions. For every one of the terms in the sequence, I have three choices. I can put zero, four, or seven for the second entry. So that's three choices. Regardless of which one of those I pick, I have three choices for the next one. Through zero, four, or seven. And so forth, I have three times three, zero and a zero, zero and a four, zero and a seven, four and a zero, four and a four, four and a seven, seven and a zero, seven and a four, seven and a seven, um, nine choices. And as I go along, for every a term of the sequence, I have three more choices. And so I have to multiply those threes and, and I will have three to the n minus one ways because there's n minus entries that I have to fill in. And for each of them, I have three choices. Now, what if you start with a seven? Well, if you start with a seven, then you can't possibly have a four come before it because you um, uh, for fall enough to start with a seven. And so all you can do after that, you can do whatever you like, but you just can't use four. You, have, you can use zeros and sevens. So just like previous case, for every entry, for every one of those n minus one terms, you have two choices this time, either a zero or a seven. And therefore you can finish that in um, two to the n minus one ways. And so the total number, I mean, so these are the three possibilities, the three cases uh, that we have split our situation in. Either we start with a zero, with a four, or with a seven. These are um, mutually de disjoint um, and, um, and they cover all cases. And therefore the total is going to be the sum of these three numbers. And therefore H of N, the total number of ways um, of making sequences of this form is H of N minus one, plus three to the n minus one, plus two to the n minus one. And, um, and h of three, for example, is going to be eight plus, um, eight was uh, h of two, um, if you remember, and, and then three squared plus two squared is 21. And h of four is going to be now 21, which is h of three, plus three cubed plus two cubed is gonna be 56. And h of five is going to be now the 56, which is h of four, plus three, um, to the n minus one plus two to the n minus one, and, and that's going to be 153. So our original question, which was how, how many sequences of length five you can have with those screwy uh, conditions, the answer is 153. And, and you see how powerful this method of recurrence relations is. So for our next uh, problem, I, I wanna add, have a diff different kind of a problem, again, the counting problem, but a, but a geometric one. So what I have is that I have a square piece of paper, that red square is my piece of paper. And um, I have drawn three straight lines, um, each starting from one side of the square, ending on another side, maybe the opposite sides, maybe the, side, the sides right next to each other, with the condition that each pairs of those three lines intersect. I don't have any parallel lines, for example, um, and two lines can't intersect more than one place, but each pair intersects in at least exactly one place. And also they're in general position, meaning that no three lines, the three lines don't all go through the same point. If I do that, then as you see in, in, in this picture on top, um, the, the piece of paper is split into seven regions. Uh, the square got split into seven regions. Okay, so what? Um, my question is that, what if I had a um, hundred lines, not just seven of them, and not, not just three of them, but seven, a um, hundred of them. If I had hundred straight lines going across, again, with the condition that every pair of lines intersect, that would be a pain to draw. Uh, but, but if you could do that, and if no three lines ever go to the same point, how many regions would you have? Okay, so again, I will generalize first, make this in a, in a, in a part of a sequence of counting problems, and then try to come up with a recurrence relation. So I will say F of N is going to be the number of regions created by n straight lines, again, going from one side of the square to the other side of the square, where each pair of the lines intersect and no three go through the same point. So f of n is that. And so what we found was, um, well, f of one, if you just have one line, um, it's going to be two, there's two regions. Um, 
uh, that, that you're going to get in your square. Um, if you add another line, then f of 2 is going to be 4. And we saw that f of 3 is 7. So the question is that what happens uh, when what's f of 100? <laughs> that, that's, that, that's the question I have. Um, so the question is not even clear if it's well posed. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that, is it even clear that there's just one answer? Or does it depend on how you draw things? Maybe if, you, if I draw the 100 lines, I get a different number of regions. And, and if you draw it, you might get a different one. I mean, I mean, maybe it depends on the position of the lines. So it's not a, a priori clear whether or not there is actually a real, the, the, an, an actual specific answer or not. OK, so again, a thought experiment. This time, the thought experiment is going to be about the last line. So we're going to focus on the last line instead of the first one. The first one isn't going to tell us anything. If you draw the first line, you're going to get two regions. Uh, but we're, we're going to worry about the last line. And we want to worry about how many regions they'll add to what we had. Um, so how many regions does it create? Because the, the, the n minus 1 lines that came before created so many regions. How many? Well, f of n minus 1. What, how many new regions are created by this new line? OK, so this last line, the nth line, there's n lines. And n minus 1 lines, imagine, are already drawn. This last line, when you draw it, is supposed to cross every one of those n minus 1 lines. When, it, when you're crossing it, how many regions does it go to? Let's think about that for a second. So, so for example, I mean, here's, here's where our original um, uh, our three lines. So where's the fourth line? So this is the fourth line, and it crosses the other three. How many regions, the old regions, does it go through? Well, um, if you think about it, um, it's going to be n regions. Why? Well, because when the line starts, it starts in some region. That's in some region it is. And then as soon as it crosses one line, it enters another uh, region. And then when it crosses another line, it enters another region. And when it crosses the, another line, it crosses another region, and, and then you're done. So there, it, it starts in a region. And then after each one of the lines that it crosses, it crosses into some new region. And so because there's, it crosses n minus 1 lines, that's n minus one regions it goes through. But then there's that first region that it started out with. So it's a total of n regions that it will cross. So when you draw the new line, it will always go through n regions of the old, uh, uh, of the old plan, of, of, of whatever the n minus one lines made. And whenever it goes through a region, it's starting from one side of it. It goes all the way to the end of the other side it splits it into two regions. So where was one region, now it becomes two regions. So every one of those n regions is now, is, is now doubled. And therefore, um, uh, so what happens is that you are adding n regions to what you had before. So, so whatever you had before, you're not adding n extra regions. Now, how many did you have before? Well, it was f of n minus one. So f of n, the number of regions that n lines make, is going to be the same as the number of regions that n minus one lines made plus n. OK, um, I mean, I like this problem. I hope you do too. Um, so, so what, what do we have? f of n is the number of regions created by n straight lines. Um, and and when, when every two of them meet, and, and no three meet, in, meet, 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 meet at a, uh, the same point, no three of them. And we found out that f of n is f of n minus 1 plus n. And we also know that f of 1 is 2. Actually, that's the only one we need. And actually, this also says that the problem is well posed. So our argument showed that if you know f of 1 equals 2, then all the other ones after that are determined. And so there is a specific answer uh, to the problem. And so we can generate some data. Um, if n is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, or 10, f of n is 2, 4, 7, 11, 16, 22, 29, 37, 46, 56. All I did was I start with a 2. Then I add the 2 to the 2. I get 4, 3, and 4 is 7. 4 and 7 is 11. 11 and 5 is 16, and so on until I get to 56. Uh, I want to go to 100, uh, but that will take me a while. I'm not going to do that. So sometimes what we do is that we um, generate data like this and try to see a pattern. I mean, do I see a pattern in those f of n's? And um, 
Yeah, because the, the pattern is that you're adding two, then three, then four, then five, then six, and so forth, and you're going that. It's easier to see if you look at f of n minus one, if you just subtract one from those, then you get uh, one, three, six, 10, 15, 21, 28, 36, 45, 55. And if you have any experience with combinatorics, these are the triangular numbers. Um, um, at the end, and uh, so what are the triangle numbers? This is one, then it's one plus two, then one plus two plus three, one plus two plus three plus four, and so forth. Um, um, so if you, if you one dot, and then if you make a triangle with three dots, and then a, a triangle with three rows with three dots, two dots, and one dots, then that will be six dots and so forth. That's why they're called triangular numbers. And so what they are is Fn minus one is one plus two plus three plus all the way till n. See, we start with one and then we add two, then we add three, then we add four. And so, so this is what this is. And what's one plus two plus three plus n? Well, what that is, is n times n plus one divided by two. The easiest way to see that is to, instead of when, when you wanna add one through n, also write n through one and write that underneath it. And instead of adding the two rows, add the two columns, all the columns. And all the columns add up to n plus one, and there's n of them, so that will be n times n plus one. But you just rewrote the what you wanted to add twice, and so you get twice what you wanted. So the, the, your final answer should be half of that. So it's n times n plus one divided by two, um, and 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 therefore f of n, which was the number of regions, we now think that it's, um, well, we, we, we knew that if it's f of n minus one plus n um, and f of one is two, that was what we got from our thought experiment. And now we're claiming that f of n is one plus n times n plus one over two. Remember f of n minus one was n times n plus one over two. So this is our claim. Now we don't know if this is really true, um, uh, this formula is, I mean, the, the original one, uh, we do know it, it came from our thought experiment that f of n is f of n minus one plus n. That was um, the recurrence relation. But this one is our conjecture based on data. And how do we prove that? We prove that using induction. So we already done base cases. We know that it, the, the, the formula works for, for, for the beginning cases. And for arbitrary k, we assume that the kth one um, is true. If, you, if you're not familiar with induction, watch my videos on induction. There are two of them. Um, so we assume that the kth case, f of k equals one plus k uh, times k plus one over two. And then we prove the next one, f of k plus one using that. f of k plus one, that means instead of n, I put k plus one. So one stays one. Instead of that n, I have k plus one. Instead of n plus one, I'll have k plus one plus one, which is k plus two divided by two. And so this is what I have to prove. So I get to assume that f of k is true to prove that f of k plus one is true. This is not cheating. This is proof by mathematical induction. What I'm doing is that I'm saying that if I know one of k is true, then the next one k plus one is true. And because I know that the first one is true, then I know that the second one is true. And because then I know the second one is true, the third one must be true. And the domino continues and all of them must be true. So this is proof by induction against, again, watch my videos on proof by induction. And so how do I do that? Well, I don't know that f of k plus one equals that or not, but I can start with f of k plus one and see uh, whether or not I get uh, what I need to. Now, what is f of k plus one? And this is where recurrence relations come in handy. If you have a recurrence relation, that's almost ready made for induction. f of k plus one, instead of n in our recurrence relation, put k plus one, f of k plus one will be f of k plus one minus one, which is f of k plus k plus one. So, this is the recurrence relation that we have. And now because of induction, I know what f of k is. f of k was the previous case. And, and that's one plus k, k times k plus one over two. And so I have one plus k, over the, the, I have that thing. And then I can factor a k plus one from these last two terms and do a little bit of algebra. And I will get one plus k plus one times k plus two divided by two and I'm done. So my formula is correct. And this is actually uh, the way we do a lot of times we do things. We do a thought experiment, not induction, thought experiment to find a recurrence relation, generate data, look for patterns, guess a pattern and prove it by induction. Okay, so let me say that one more time. To find a recurrence relation, we don't use induction. Um, instead, we focus on the first or last instance or we split things up into different cases. We will do that in our last example. Um, and after finding the recurrence relation, uh, you use it to often use it to generate data. You can actually answer all kinds of questions using recurrence relations, not just um, individual cases. You can come up with all kinds of things. And you, if you see any patterns, 
you can uh, you use induction to prove them. There's other ways to approach uh, recurrence relations. Um, there's a method called unwinding where you uh, slowly go back um, and, and start with FFN and you have FFN in terms of the previous cases, then you use the uh, recurrence relation on that, on, on those things you have and, and, and unwind it, go back all the way down to the back and you might get a formula that way. If you have a special kind of a recurrence relation, something called a linear recurrence relation, uh, say with constant coefficients, um, you, there, there are methods for solving those. Um, and general methods that, that resemble differential equations. Um, and uh, there's matrix methods using diagonalization of matrices to deal with, uh, uh, with um, uh, recurrence relations. I have a video on that in my linear algebra uh, lectures. Uh, and you can use something called generating functions, which is a subject of later videos in this uh, series of videos on combinatorics. And in fact, there's one for uh, dealing with recurrence relations using generating functions. But those things are not what we want to focus on now. And in fact, it's not even using the induction that we want to focus on now, just how you find them. And so I have one final example for you. And, and this is another um, accounting problem. So I have 11 identical toys and four identical boxes. And I want to place um, the toys in the boxes. And I want to know how many ways I can do that. How many different ways are there to put 11 toys into four boxes. You could, for example, put all the toys in one box. Um, that would be one way. And it doesn't matter which box because all the boxes are identical. Or you could be more, distribute them more evenly. Like you can put three here, two there, um, and, the, and, and the rest in the third one and leave the fourth box empty. Um, so, um, so I wanna know what are all the different ways that you can distribute 11 identical toys in four identical boxes. So again, um, what I will do is that I will generalize the problem and I will say that H of MK, and this time is a function of two variables, is the number of ways to put M identical toys in K identical boxes. Okay, and, and what we wanna find is H114. Um, so, so that's what we're looking for. And again, I'm gonna do a thought experiment. And I'm gonna do this thought experiment this time, not by thinking of what I'm gonna do with the first toy or the last toy, but I'm thinking of it in terms of two different possibilities. One case is that if whatever I do, I leave one of the boxes empty. And my, my second choice is that I don't leave any of the boxes empty. So um, nothing else could happen. Either I, I use all the boxes or I don't. Okay, now in the first case, if one of the boxes uh, uh, is empty, if I'm going to keep one of the boxes empty, then the problem re reduces to, putting M toys in K minus one boxes. Now those boxes, I don't have to use all of them either. Just like before, I have to uh, distribute M toys, but I'm gonna do them in K minus one boxes. And it doesn't really matter which box is empty because the boxes are identical. And so how many ways can I put M toys in K minus one boxes? And the answer is H of M comma K minus one ways, because that's how many ways you put M toys in K minus one uh, boxes. So this counts, all the different ways where one box is empty. On the other hand, the other choice is that none of the boxes are empty, but how am I gonna make none of the boxes empty? Well, first you've got to put one toy in each box. Do that um, because you want to keep all the boxes happy and you want all the boxes to have a toy in them. So if you do that, then you've used K of the toys. So now you have M minus K toys and you can put those and, and, and now you distribute M minus K toys into K boxes. And how many ways can you do that? And all the boxes are still identical. They all have one toy in them instead of zero toys. And so the answer is going to be um, um, H of M minus K comma K ways. So, and those are the only two cases. The two cases are disjoint and they cover all the possible cases. So the total is H M K, uh, the total number of ways of putting um, identical toys in uh, M identical toys in K identical boxes is H of M comma K minus one plus H of M minus K comma K. Now you have to be a little bit careful. Um, uh, K can't just be any random thing. K has to be between one and M so that neither one of these things have negative things in them. And so for example, the case where you're putting one toy in each box, you have to have at least as many toys as you have boxes to be able to do that. And if you're gonna have one of the boxes empty, you've gotta have at least one box. So this whole argument only works if K is 
greater or equal to one and less than or equal to m. Okay, have I solved my problem? Well, yes, because um, again, h of m k is um, number of ways to put m toys identical toys in in uh, k identical boxes, and I found out for k between one and m that h m k h m k is h m k minus one plus h m minus k comma k. Now, after doing some initial cases, I can use this now to create a table. And in fact, here will be a table for HMK. Now, some of like, like the first row, that's when you have one box. If you have one box, doesn't matter how many toys you have, there's just one way to do it. You're gonna put all those toys in that one box. If you don't have a, um, a toy, the first column, the zeroth column, again, there's only one way to do it. Just don't do anything and you've already put all the toys in the boxes. Um, if you're not happy with that, go to the next column. If you have just one toy, again, there's only one way to do it. So this, uh, these first two columns, the zeroth and the first column are all ones. Um, and you can do some of the other uh, earlier ones also. In fact, as soon as uh, the number of boxes is more than the number of toys, then there will be uh, some redundancy because you will have some boxes that will be left empty. And so that's why, for example, here, uh, these numbers are repeating the two, two and the three, three. But um, now uh, you can use this though, um, after you do the first initial cases, you, you can come all the other, find the other ones. Like for example, this 10 here in row three, column eight, why is that 10 there? So that's H eight, three. So according to our formula that, that 10 is this five on top of it, that's the HMK minus one plus this other five here. And what is that five? That's H of M minus K case in the same row but, but which column do I go to? Well, here I go eight minus three is five. So I go to column five. And so that five plus that five equals 10. And so if you continue like that, you will get that H 11, four, which was the original problem. You get that it's 27. 27 is 16 plus what? Well, in the same row, but you have to go to the column um, marked by 11 minus four, um, 11 minus uh, four, is the column seven. And so that's that 11 here. This 11 plus that 16 gives you 27. And now I have solved the original problem. The number of ways of distributing 11 identical toys among four identical boxes is 12. So this is the end of this lecture. Um, see you in, in, in the future lectures on combinatorics.